And thank you for joining us today. I'm Brother James, and I greet you one more time in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Our study of the great Bible book of Revelation brings us to chapter number four. Some of you thought we would never get out of chapters two and three, but here we are. Revelation four, a short chapter, but a powerful chapter and a great deal of uh, prophetic material to be found here. The Bible says in Revelation 4 and verse number 1, After this, seven churches, after this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither. And I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. We'll, we'll leave you in suspense for a few minutes as to who it might be that's sitting on the throne in heaven. I'll only give you one guess, but I'll not give you the answer just yet. Now, this door takes our minds back to two places. In the prior chapter, Revelation 3 and verse 20, the Lord Jesus Christ said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and he will and will sup with him and he with me. So what we have here is if a man does not open the door, Revelation 3:20, he will not see this open door. Revelation chapter 4 and verse number 1. If a man does open the door, Revelation 3.20, and receive the Lord Jesus Christ, he will have this door, Revelation 4.1, into uh, heaven opened for him. The other place that uh, our minds uh, are, are taken to is uh, John chapter 10. John chapter 10 and here the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking of himself and says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. So the door to heaven is the Lord Jesus Christ. The way to heaven is the Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation for the sinner is the Lord Jesus Christ. That that door, we, we're, not, we're not denying that there, there is a literal heaven, and we're not denying that there is a door through which uh, John entered in order to get this revelation for us, but we're also making certain that each of you know that the way to heaven is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not good works, it's not religion, it's not religions, it's, it's one person, Jesus Christ. Now, the historical beginning of this section of Revelation, while not fixed in terms of years and months, is absolutely fixed relative to two other prophetic periods. In chapter 1, we have the Lord in his resurrection glory. You remember in verse 19, uh, we are told, or John was told, write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. In chapter 4, verse 1, we learn, After this I looked, and behold, a door. So what do we have? We have chapter 1, the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ, chapters 2 and 3, the letters to the churches, and then chapter 4, after this, indicating the things of past and present ages are contained in Revelation 2 and 3, and when we go to Revelation chapter number 4, future ages begin. Thank the Lord for that. And the church goes out. We cannot cover all of chapter 4 and 5 in just a few minutes to, to get you the full orientation, but uh, John is, is taken up. He hears this call, and he hears a 
like a trumpet talking, and that, that voice says, come up hither, and verse 2, immediately he is transported, not not over time, not through time, immediately upon hearing the voice like a trumpet, he is in heaven itself. The church, chapter 2, the church, chapter 3, on earth, the church round about the throne, chapter 4 and chapter 5. The church unmentioned, Revelation 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 through 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. And here she comes with the Lord Jesus Christ in chapter number 19. Now, this is God's plan. He set it forth. He explained it. It's not a hidden thing. It's not a secret thing. Acts chapter 15 says, Acts chapter number 15, and let's start at verse number 13. After they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree, the words of the prophets, as it is written, after this, I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof and will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. So what do we have? God deals with, the flesh and blood descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob throughout the course of the Old Testament history. Genesis 12, all the way up through Malachi, the prophets belong to the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The kings belong to the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The other peoples only, only get a mention as they interact with this family that descends from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then we have the Gospels. The Lord Jesus Christ came unto his own, and his own received him not. You, you couldn't possibly make his own. The church, his own received him not. You couldn't possibly make his own save people. His own received him not. So his people reject him. His people crucify him. And the Lord then begins or commences the work that he said he would commence. I will build my church, Matthew 16, 18, which means his church was not being built throughout the Old Testament because it, it's not there. The foundation of the church is the Lord Jesus Christ. We are told in Exodus that the foundation of Egypt is the day at which that nation began. We are told in Joshua, the foundation of Jericho is the day on which that, that city was built. We are told the foundation of the temple and the foundation of Solomon's house were laid at a point in time. Uh, you read that in 1 Kings. In Psalm 102, the Bible says that God laid the foundation of the earth. There's, there's no earth and then God lays the foundation, then there's an earth. There's no Egypt. The foundation is laid, then that nation exists. There is no city of Jericho. A man lays the foundation and builds the city. Solomon has no great house. God has no great temple. The stones are brought out of the quarry. The foundation is set. Up goes the building. If Jesus Christ is the foundation of the church, and he is, Ephesians 2, if Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone upon which the church is built, and he is, Ephesians chapter number 2, then there's no church prior to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So this church has a starting place, and it's very clearly marked in the Bible. And the, and the apostles are trying to decide in Acts 15, do we reach back to the time prior to the church and lay hold upon the laws that God gave to the nation of Israel? And do we bring them forward and make them the laws for the New Testament church? And the determination by the Holy Spirit was, no, that's, 
That's a separate thing, and I'll, I'll deal with that again later. But first, I'm going to gather out of primarily the Gentiles a people for my name. That's verse 15. And to this degree, the words are 14. Uh, Simon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And that's what you have in 1 Peter 2. They're not a people, now they're a people. They were not a nation, now they're a nation. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written, after this, after God is taking from every kindred, every tongue, every tribe, every people, a people for his name, after he finishes that, I will return and build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. He's going to go back to his dealings with the family that descends from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as his primary focus after he is finished calling unto himself a people for his name, which at this present hour and for nearly 2,000 years now has been his primary focus. But, but after that, he's going to go back and rebuild that uh, tabernacle of David and rebuild the ruins that are fallen down. In the meantime, look in Romans chapter number 11. Romans chapter 11, and people want to know, starting at verse 1, I say then, if God cast away his people, God forbid, for I also am an Israelite. So who are his people? Nation of Israel. Of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. That's not the church. That's not born again people. Before God began to build this church, he knew a people. What has he done with the people that he foreknew? Now that he's building the church, has he cast them away? What ye not? What the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel saying, not against the church, against Israel saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars and I am left alone and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then, at this present time also, there is a, a remnant according to the election of grace. So God has an elect, a chosen people, and by his grace, though they are very, very few in number, that people, that nation, that elect chosen group has been preserved. A remnant of them, I'll grant you. Now, the Bible says coming down here to verse number, Revelation 11, coming down to verse number, oh, how far do we go? Um, 20... Let's do um, 21. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness. Otherwise, thou also shalt be cut off. God stopped dealing with Israel. He cut them off. And now he's warning these who have been called from out of the Gentile nations, that, that call that's going out to all the world, I'll, I'll do the same with you if you don't respond to my call. Verse 24, or 23, uh, And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, should be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. As soon as they want to believe the word of God, uh, God will deal with them as he did before. For if thou wert cut off, or cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. What does he mean? He, he's got a tree. He cuts some branches off. He puts some other branches in their place. Uh, they don't respond properly, cuts them off, and gets the first branches and puts them back in. I, I don't get it. I don't follow it. All right, here we go. I would not that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel. Not the church, 
not the Gentiles, Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. That's what you read about in Acts 15. I'm going to call out of the Gentiles a people for my name. I'm going to build my church. Romans 11 says, if someone who comes from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob wants to get in on that by believing the gospel, they certainly may. And then when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, what is God going to do? Just what he said he would do in Acts 15, start dealing with his elect chosen nation once again. Watch it, verse 26. And so all Israel shall be saved. He didn't say every individual citizen of the nation of Israel from Genesis 12 to eternity shall be saved. He's going to save the nation as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Israel, Jacob. Israel, the name God used for the people when they exercised faith. Jacob, the name he used for them when they were walking in unbelief. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes, for the gifts of call and, and calling of God are without repentance. Now, let me slow down a little bit, and, and, and let's, let's work on this. God has a people that he chose. They are called his elect people. They wear him out. They wear him out for 40 years in the wilderness. They wear him out with their un unwillingness to take all the land of Canaan in the books of Joshua. They, they wear him out with their apostasy in the book of Judges. They wear him out wanting Saul for a king. They wear him out with their, their uh, uh, crummy, crummy <laughs> offerings and sacrifices. The prophets are sent to rebuke them and get nowhere. They have a couple of revivals and just fizzle out. And, and finally, the Lord says, you know what? I'm going to start a new thing. Isaiah 28, 16. I, I'm going to start a new thing. I, I, I'll, I'll read it to you. We're going to put so much on the table, it's going to be hard to mix it all together, but we can do it. We can do it. So you, you stay with me. Don't get angry because you thought you might have heard something you didn't agree with. Just, just stay, stay, stay in there. Follow the Bible. Isaiah 20, 28 and verse um, 14. Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule this people which is in Jerusalem, because ye have said, We have made a covenant with death, and with hell are we at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us. For we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. These people, God's chosen people, had so rejected the Lord that they were making covenants with death and agreements with hell and believing when God sent wrath and judgment upon them for rejecting him, that death and hell would protect them from God. That's how far gone they were. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation stone, that's a starting place, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, that's the starting place, and he that believeth shall not make haste. So God said, I'm not going to be in a hurry about this, but I'm going to build a new thing. I, I'm, going to, I'm going to do something new because I'm tired of dealing with you people. Israel, Jerusalem, the elect nation. I, I'm tired of it. Well, what is this cornerstone? What is this uh, sure foundation? Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number uh, 19. God writing to Gentiles who trusted Christ as their Savior, gathered out of the Gentile nations unto, to be a people for his name, he says to them, Now therefore you no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, 
Jesus Christ himself being the chief corner stone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. Now, now, watch. Abraham, Genesis 12, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, 12 tribes, Egyptian bondage, redeemed from Egypt on Passover night, 40 years in the wilderness, book of Joshua conquering the land of Canaan, all the kings, all the prophets, that is the nation of Israel and God's dealing with the nation of Israel. He's fed up with them. He says through Isaiah, I'm going to start a new thing. I'm going to lay a cornerstone. I'm going to lay a foundation. I'm going to build a new thing. He, he's, he's so worn out with their offerings and their sacrifices. By the time he gets to Malachi, he says, you tell them, you tell their priest, I'll take their sacrifices and, and spread the garbage of the sacrifices, the, the dung of their offerings on their faces. And God doesn't speak to them for 400 years. And when he does, finally, the forerunner announces the Messiah. The Messiah comes unto his own. His own received him, receive him not. Jesus Christ is crucified. He is buried. He rises from the dead. And the Holy Spirit says in the book of Ephesians, there's your chief cornerstone. There's your foundation. We're going to start something new. The church. The church. The church is not Israel Part two, it's not a, a new patch sewn on an old garment. It's not new wine poured into old bottles. He tried to explain that to you. Some people got it, most people didn't. Now, that brings us back to Romans 11. Brings us back to Romans chapter 11, which I should have held on to but didn't, but we'll find it. And, and watch these words now. Blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, and so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. Romans 3 told the Christian how God took away their sins the moment they trusted Christ as Savior. Romans 4 told the Christian how God had taken away their sins the moment they trusted Christ as Savior. Romans 5, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus and so forth. So if the deliverer has to come out of Zion, Romans 11. And the Savior has already come down from heaven, suffered, bled, and died on the cross, risen from the dead, and taken away the sins of all those who put their faith and trust in his finished work. This is a different salvation for a different people in a different day. The people reading Romans know their sins are taken away by the blood of Jesus Christ. This nation of Israel didn't trust Jesus Christ. They're going to suffer the wrath of God for seven terrible years called the time of Jacob's trouble at the end of which they will finally Look upon me whom they pierced and mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. And when they finally turn to the Lord, he will, he will take away their sins. Now look at this 28th verse. As concerning the gospel. What's the gospel? Christ died for our sins, was buried, rose again the third day. All of that in accord with the scripture. And if you believe that, you are saved. Well, these people, Israel, these people, the elect, they are enemies of the gospel. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. So you're the Christians receiving the epistle to the Romans are not Israel. And Israel is not 
the saved people receiving the letter to the Romans. I, I hope you see that. I, I don't know how it could be any, any clearer. Now, as concerning the gospel, the enemy is for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. An apostrophe, I, I, I know, very, very few of you, if, if you've been to, to public school in the last 30 years, you don't have the slightest idea what to do with an apostrophe. I, I, I know that by billboards, advertisements, books, text messages, emails, apostrophe shows possession. This is not God possessing. Now watch. As touching the election, they are beloved for the father apostrophe S. That would be one father. You could make that God the father. But the apostrophe is after the S. Who, who possesses the election? The father's apostrophe. The church has no fathers. Jesus said, Call no man on earth your father. I will build my church. And we, we covered that in the, in the history of those seven churches. We, we don't have fathers in our church. If you have a church with fathers, you're in the wrong church. <laughs> you're, you're not in God's church. You're in something that thinks it's Israel with Christ sprinkled on top. Who are the fathers? Come on, come on now. Look at the passage. Gentiles, Jews, verse 1. Hath God cast away his people? I am also an Israelite of the seed of Abraham. Who are the fathers? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. God made a covenant with them. He elected them. He chose them. I will deal with you on the earth. I will give you a piece of land. I will make you the head of the nations. I will give you a city, Jerusalem. I will give you a throne there. David will sit on that throne. God promised all of that. If they don't believe it, he will, because of their unbelief, postpone it until the day they believe. But he will not lie. He will not break covenant. So what do we have? We have, again, just as we saw in Acts 15, we have in Romans 11, Israel, 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 Genesis 12, all the way up to Calvary, and then the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, the foundation stone, cornerstone of a new building, the church, the church upon this rock, I will build future my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So there's a time when there's no church. There's a time when the gates of hell prevail. In between those two times, the church. Israel over here, Israel over here, the church right in the middle. We'll, we'll see it. We'll see it 20 times before we finish studying Revelation. If you don't get that, if you, if, you put, if you put the church back in the Old Testament, if you put the church forward into God's wrath upon his unbelieving people, you're, you're going to make a big mess out of the Bible and tear up some churches doing so. Come to Hosea chapter 3. Book of Hosea chapter number 3. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea. There we go. Hosea chapter number three. And let's read starting at verse number, verse number four. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king. Coming up on 2,000 years right now. And, well, well, more than that, 400 before, well, the Babylonian captivity. Now, you've got to go way back. You've got to go way back. Many days without a king and without a prince and without a sacrifice and without an image and without an ephod and without teraphim. So all these things that God established with Israel, gave to Israel, set up 
for Israel. They've been without them for 25, 26 centuries. And because of that, people suppose God's all through with Israel, or people suppose the church is Israel. Verse number, verse number five, or four, uh, five, yes. Afterward, afterward, you know where you read that? Acts 15, verse 16. Afterward, shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God and David their king and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. What do you have? Israel, Israel, in between the church. Now, we, we, we have wandered so far from where we started in Revelation 4.1 that I don't know that we can get back, but I, I, I've got to wander even farther. This is a lovely scenic hiking trail that we're on. We, we're way off the main path, but it's, it's really pretty out here. There are some of you uh, watching right now, and you were taught, and you had to be taught this because you never would have found this reading the Bible. You were taught that before Jesus died on the cross, men were saved by keeping the law. And since Jesus died on the cross, men are saved by the grace of God. I, I, I'm not... I, I'm, I'm trying to... Uh, uh, it, it, the trail's forking, and this one goes way on, way on out in the woods. So we, we'll take the, the little short one here. If people before the cross were saved by keeping the law, then no one was saved for the first 1,500 years of human history because there was no law. If people were saved by keeping the law before Jesus died on the cross, only Jews were saved because God only gave the law to the nation of Israel. And, and, if... People before Calvary were saved by keeping the law. Then no one was saved after the Babylonians destroyed the temple because without sacrifice, they couldn't keep the law. And without the temple and the priesthood, they couldn't offer the sacrifices required under the law. So it sounds, it sounds kind of uh, right. It sounds kind of deep to say there were different ways for people to be saved in different times, and one of those ways was keeping the law, except for the fact that if you analyze that statement biblically, it, it falls apart uh, rather badly. No law, no law before Exodus 20. No law for Gentiles from Exodus 20 to today. And no ability to keep the law by the nation of Israel during all the time periods at which they can't get to their temple at Jerusalem to obey the law. So it's a, it's a theory, uh, but it, it doesn't hold up any better than does the theory of evolution. All right, back to chapter 4, verse 1 of Revelation. We've got to try and get through at least this verse. Don't think it'll happen. Chapter 4, verse 1, after this I looked, after what? God dealing with the churches on earth. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. This is not Jews being restored to the land of Palestine. This is not God reestablishing the borders of his chosen earthly people. This is somebody leaving this world and going somewhere else. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. 
This could be the first voice from the opened heaven, or it could refer back to the first voice John heard in chapter 1, and saying that this voice was now speaking like a trumpet. Either way, it's the Lord. Then he says, with me. A uh, uh, voice talking with me. Salvation is personal. Praise God. And so too will be the call to leave this earth and ascend up into heaven. Speaking with me. And the call is, come up hither. Noah and God were with one another. God said in Genesis 7, 1, called Noah to come with him into the ark. He sent Lot thither, Genesis 19, verses 16 to 23. He says, get out of here, go. But the Lord tells us, praise God, tells the church, John as their representative, come up, come up, come up. Come up hither, I want you to be with me. And immediately, and immediately, I was in the Spirit. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. He, he is alive on the earth. He's alive in heaven. No spaceship, <laughs> no chariot of fire, no whirlwind. He's here, then he's there. Praise God. You ever read that, 1 Corinthians 15? In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we'll leave this old world behind, and before you know it, you'll be in the presence of the Lord himself. He said um, that he was in the Spirit. Immediately I was in the Spirit. Behold, the throne was set in heaven. Uh, were this the actual rapture of the church, not a prophetic foreview, John would have his body glorified, Philippians 3, verses 20 to 21, and he would be changed out of his earthly uh, tabernacle and into his heavenly temple. But since this is not the rapture of the church, but only John prefiguring the rapture of the church so the Lord can show the church what will happen to them when he has finished building his church and turns to build again the ruins of, of uh, David's uh, tabernacle, which has fallen down, John is in the spirit, not in his glorified body. All right, well, hadn't really planned on venturing uh, so far afield, uh, but there it is. I, I will say this to you, and I, I say it after... 40 plus years of teaching the Bible, I say it after 40 plus years of dealing with lost people and saved people. If you do not understand the difference between the earthly, physical nation of Israel and the heavenly, spiritual church, if you do not understand the difference between Jews and Gentiles born of human parents and the church which is regenerated, reborn of God, if, if you do not distinguish between the Jew, the Gentile, and the church of God, 1 Corinthians 10, 32, you will never, never, never be able to properly understand the scriptures. It's absolutely vital that you get that, especially as we move ahead in the study of the book of Revelation. All right, those are our notes on Revelation chapter four and verse number one. Hope that you'll uh, join us next time. We'll press ahead into verse two with a look at the throne.